So this lesbian walks into a Muslim barber shop and asks for a businessman's haircut. Now, if that sounds like the beginning of a very politically incorrect joke, you're right. Political correctness is like poker. So a white Christian male has the lowest poker hand. It's like he's got nothing, just like a high card, maybe one ace. A lesbian like Faith McGregor, well, that's like three of a kind. That's pretty powerful. So which is a better hand in politically correct poker? A lesbian who wants a boy's haircut or a Muslim who doesn't want to give it to her because she's a girl? I'm betting on the barber. All right, you may have seen that segment on The Source a little while ago. That happened while I was away enjoying the sunshine in Florida, not the flurries here in Ottawa. But it does involve the story of Faith McGregor, who went to a Toronto barber shop where all the barbers are, are Muslim, and demanded a haircut. They said no. She went to the Human Rights Commission, and here's what she has said. I want the shop to be cited and forced to give haircuts in the fashion they provide, that'd be barbershop style, to any woman or man that asks for one. Of course, the reason the Muslim barbers say they can't do it is they say their faith precludes them from cutting the hair of a woman that they're not related to in some way. So what trumps? Gender discrimination, freedom of religion, or is it something else? Karen Selleck joins us now. She is with the Canadian Constitution Foundation, and uh, she joins us from her office in Belleville, Ontario. Karen, you wrote a great piece for the Huffington Post the other day where you said... You'd probably side with the Muslims on freedom of religion as a real right, but really it goes deeper than that. Phil is in on the idea of competing rights and how one might win over the other. Right. I mean, I think it was fairly obvious from the time that they adopted the human rights legislation that they were going to eventually end up with competing rights, and the commission has now finally admitted that they do. But in my view, um, the, the very concept of right implies that, that it is inviolable. So if you have competing rights, um, one of them can't be a genuine right. If you're going to, if a commission, the Human Rights Commission or Tribunal, can award somebody the right to violate someone else's right because there's a trumping, then the one that's being trumped obviously wasn't really a right. Um, or it's a political decision, as sure. has often been the case. Well, you really can't have rights that conflict with each other um, unless they are phony rights, artificial rights that have been created by the state. And in my view, that's what most of the rights under the Human Rights Code actually are. Yeah, I've covered uh, court cases and often read decisions where the Supreme Court will say there are no competing rights, there's a matrix, and, and they get into language that sets themselves up to be able to side with one group over the other. And the one that always sticks in my craw is the uh, Francophone parents in Quebec who wanted to send their kids to English school. They should be allowed to send their kids to whatever school they want, but despite that being enumerated in the charter, the Supreme Court sided with collective rights and said, oh, no, 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 there's a, that can be trumped because you've got to maintain the heritage and culture of Quebec. So it's okay to discriminate against these people and force them into a school they don't want. Yeah. That kind of goes in line with what you're saying, though, not, not the Supreme Court decision, the ridiculousness of it, that there should just be unadorned freedom. That's right. Um, you know, we all have, we, would, we should all have the same freedom. Um, so, for instance, when you talk about the right to life, all that means is that we have the right to have everybody else not kill us. So I have the right to life, which means that nobody else can kill me, and other people have the right to life, which means that nobody else can kill them. But it's not an affirmative right that gives us the power to impose our needs on somebody. So my right to life doesn't mean that you have the obligation to give me food. And um, when someone like Ms. McGregor comes along and says, I have the right to a haircut, she's essentially saying, I have the right to force somebody else to engage in labor for my benefit, um, even though she intends to pay him. No amount of money would satisfy him because he doesn't want to do it. So she's essentially saying, I have the right to this man's involuntary servitude. And in my view, that's so repugnant a position that, um, you know, our human rights code should not be trying to enforce that. Okay, uh, let me play devil's advocate for a moment then. Uh, answer those people that would say, well, then you'll just have uh, someone will walk into a store or a restaurant or a barber shop, and the person will look at them and say, we don't like your kind around here. And it could just be the way they look. It could be their race. It could be their religion and deny them service. Should they be allowed to do that? Well, the market actually punishes people who discriminate. So that if somebody in business discriminates against customers, 
he will he'll lose business. He won't be as profitable as if he didn't discriminate because he'll he'll limit his own market. If he discriminates against employees, he will limit his possibility of getting the best possible employee. If he discriminates against suppliers, again, he'll limit, eliminate the possibility of getting the best suppliers, the best products, the best, you know, variety of things. So it's a it's a it's a self limiting thing to discriminate when you're in business. It hurts the individual who does discriminate, and, um, and it just imposes its own penalties. The, the number of people who would be willing to do that when they could have greater profits by dealing with everybody, I think number of people who really are genuinely bigoted enough to, to cut their own throat um, is very small. But it has happened before, and the human rights uh, apparatus in this uh, country has uh, cited not with people advocating freedom of religion. And I think of the case of Scott Brockie. He was a printer. He was asked to print some very sexually explicit and graphic material for uh, gay and lesbian archives, I believe the group was called. He described it that way anyway. He said it's beyond what he would want to do and, and said, no, I, I can't do this. And the court forced him to do it and to pay a fine. Uh, so do you expect that in this case that the, either the courts or the tribunals will say, you've got to cut Ms. McGregor's hair and pay her a fine. Well, it will be interesting to see, as Ezra says, whether there is a hierarchy, whether, whether um, Muslims will rank differently from Christians in, uh, in, in what they are going to be compelled to do. Um, I know there's a lot of people betting that it will be different from Scott Brockie's case, although really, theoretically, you know, these, are, these are the same. Both of the uh, business people in this case are invoking freedom of religion. So the outcome really, if the human rights uh, tribunal is consistent, the, the outcome should be the same. Okay, how do we uh, go from where we are now as a society to where you think that we should be of just saying, look, we all have the same rights, leave us alone? Because I, I hear people invoking positive rights all the time, yeah. uh, the right to water, the right to yeah. adequate food. Once you start saying that, I always say, look, if you're doing that and the person doesn't have water, they can go live somewhere and then demand the government bring them water because they have a right to it, so it must be supplied. Uh, how do you turn the culture around on this issue? It, it really will take a philosophical revolution. I think that um, this culture is so steeped in the idea that, uh, that you know, people have a right to something from the state, and, and they don't even think about, well, where does the state get it from? Obviously, the state you know, doesn't create these things themselves, this, this itself. The state has to go out and coerce somebody into providing Stuff. So, you know, the, I think um, it will take a fairly significant uh, philosophical revolution for people to understand that what really is objectionable is coercion and that nobody has the right to coerce anybody else into providing them with something and you don't have the right to get the state to go and do it on your behalf. So I like to compare it to, um, you know, somebody uh, meeting up in a dark alley with two muggers. You know, if you take a vote, the victim and the two muggers vote on who gets the, the victim's wallet. Well, you know, on a, <laughs> on a dem democratic basis, the victim's going to lose and the muggers are going to walk away with the wallet. But that's not, you know, that's not um, legitimate just because it's been democratically decided. And people have to realize that when you put the state in the place of the two muggers, that's no more valid than the two muggers just uh, taking the wallet. All right, Karen Selleck, thanks so much. Words of, words of wisdom for sure. You're welcome, Brian. All right, share your thoughts with us, facebook.com. You know how to find our page. Uh, let us know what you think. More to come.